Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sister Lebanon, are you good to go? We are good to go. Awesome. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming out on a nice, brisk uh, Monday night. Um, we'll, we'll come together today to talk about an uh, important topic, personal safety. Um, uh, before we get started, just a couple of ground rules. If everyone can please mute your microphones and uh, in your video. We'll go through the session. Um, if you can ask questions in the chat box, we will get to those after we go through the material. And if there's time for live questions, we'll entertain those at the end. We'll try to keep it to one hour exactly and end here by right after eight o'clock. Um, so inshallah, we'll get started. Um, so personal safety, what is it? I mean, it's important to take it seriously. It's something that can be taken for granted. Um, what we'll talk about today, there's obviously not a one size fits all solution for everything. There's tons of things you can do to prepare yourself uh, and your families, weapons training, self-defense, martial arts. We're not going to cover everything, obviously, tonight. Um, tonight's focus with the increased political environment, the political tension, there's been an increase uh, in hostile personal interactions in the public sphere. Um, so we'll focus on items um, um, in, in that realm today. Um, we'll focus on personal safety in a public setting. Okay, and, then, and the purpose of this is to give some common sense suggestions um, that are practical and can be applied by most people, inshallah. Um, I'm, my name is Shazan Akbar. I'm the director of security at RCM. Tonight we'll be joined by Dr. Asim Kidwai. He's a former BIRB member of RCM and instrumental member of the security team. We're also being joined by uh, Serena Nizamuddin, illustrious legal mind of Gwinnett County. She is a supervisory assistant district attorney for Gwinnett County. Um, in her capacity as one of the chief law enforcement officers of Gwinnett County, she also puts away uh, prosecutes violent felonies. So personal safety is something she takes seriously uh, and is always on her mind in her job capacity. So with that, um, we'll get started and I'll, I'll throw out some scenarios. Uh, we've taken some questions in advance um, and then inshallah, if, awesome or Sabrina, if you can kind of interject and, and uh, I'll try to keep the discussion flowing. Um, but these situations, we'll, we'll get into the, the situations, we'll dissect them any lessons learned, and then we'll come back and summarize it at the end and take any additional questions. Sound good? Okay, so one of the things um, uh, that's been increasing, and a lot of folks have talked to me personally about this, is interactions, hostile interactions uh, in vehicles. Um, you know, so you're, you're, you or your spouse, your family are in a vehicle, you're driving, uh, in a, and you notice a vehicle starts to follow you, okay, whether it's in the daytime or at nighttime, um, you know, what would you recommend in that scenario? What would you do? Um, obviously, situational awareness is, is a big thing and a theme we'll be talking about throughout all the scenarios tonight, um, you know, to understand your, your situation, your circumstances, your location, where things are. Uh, but in general, what should you do in a situation if you're in a vehicle and somebody starts to follow you? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Um, this is, um, I kind of wanted to start off, Shez, if you don't mind, with just a couple things to maybe give you a foundation to the scenarios in order to answer them uh, better. As Shez indicated to you, Shazan is also my cousin. Uh, as uh, Shazan indicated to you, I have been a prosecutor for 15 years. And in dealing with victims, especially victims um, who have been part of some kind of road rage incident, we have the luxury of being able to uh, speak with them post incident to kind of understand a little bit about how things came to the um, uh, end that they did. And what we have found with speaking with victims is a lot of times when there are stranger and stranger road rage incidences, they are usually caused because someone gets angry and there is a back and forth between the two individuals. And that is what escalates into ultimately a violent encounter. So my suggestion is in any situation that you find yourself, whether it is your fault or the fault of the other driver, the main goal that should be yours is to de-escalate. That is the key word in almost all of these scenarios, is to de-escalate the scenario. 
don't speed up, don't give them some sort of a symbol, don't scream at them. Whatever they are saying to you, keep your eyes on the road, keep driving and de-escalate the situation. Now, where do you go? Uh, you go as far away as you can from the person who is following you. You get on your cell phone, you alert law enforcement as to the description of the vehicle, as to the description of the individual, if you can, but the main thing is to remove yourself from that scenario, get to a well-lit and public arena. That is the main thing. If you are on the highway, get off onto an exit that you may be familiar with um, or get into a location that you are familiar with. You don't wanna go down an isolated road. You don't wanna go down a exit that you are unfamiliar with. You want to be in a situation where you are surrounded by people. People don't like to act illegally when there are numerous witnesses around. At that point, when you are removing yourself from the situation, the other individual usually just either drives off, says a lot of bad things, or drives away. But the main goal is to de-escalate and to remove yourself from that situation. So in, a, in such a circumstance, would you recommend going to a police station specifically? Um, well, you have to be familiar with where your police stations right. are. So this is this is one thing. And as a general outlier, um, I always tell people when I speak with individuals about safety, I always tell them to remember a few things. I, I want them to remember the acronym PACA, P-A-C-A. -A. Remember that, write it down, ingrain it in your memory. And basically what that stands for is P, preparation and plan. You've got to have a plan for you and your family in almost any scenario. We live in a tumultuous time. You have to have a plan that you sit down with your family and say, if we are home and someone breaks into our house in the middle of the night, this is what you do. We get the kids, we go into this location, we have our cell phone fully charged, you remember to get the cell phone, you hide. You're in a car, we're being followed. This is the plan. We get to a location that we know, we get off the exit, we de-escalate. De You've got to have a plan, and in having that plan, you have to prepare for that plan. You have to have certain items. You've got to have a phone charger in your car. You have to make sure your car is um, fully tanked with gas. You've got to prepare for your safety and plan. Um, a is awareness. You've got to be aware of not only your situation, but the circumstances, the environment, the people around you. There is nothing that a criminal loves more than an individual who's not paying any attention, who's just walking down the street with their head in their phone, who's sitting in their car, literally texting, has no idea what's going on. That is the ideal victim. And people are looking out for you in that situation. C, gotta stay calm. If you're not calm, then nothing is gonna go according to plan. I know uh, my mom <laughs> and probably a lot of uh, my aunties, they completely freak out in any situation. They completely freak out. They don't know what to do. They're, they're getting scared, they're crying, they're going all over the place. They are not in control of what's happening at that point. You've got to stay calm. If you are not calm, you are not protecting yourself. Therefore, you're not protecting your family. And finally, A, action. You have to be prepared to act, whether it is to run like you have never run before, whether it is to fight like you've never fought before, whether it's to scream louder than you've ever screamed, you've got to be ready to take action. So remember those four things. Tell your family those four things. Tell your children those four things. Practice that. And when you do, then in these situations, these synopsises that we'll be talking about today, they will be less terrifying and you'll actually be able to um, protect yourself and your family. I just wanted to add uh, one thing to, to what Sabrina said. Um, she said that, you know, road rage starts because somebody gets angry and it's usually when somebody cuts you off or something like that. So follow, you know, the, the rules and regulations of driving and just be nice, right? Um, it's, it's always better to prevent yourself from being in a situation than having to deal with a situation, right? So if you can even prevent yourself from getting into that first place, that's even better. So one of the things to do is, you know, give people the right of way, you know, you'll be a couple minutes late, but, but less chance of you having to deal with anything like that. <laughs> So 
So, so I guess to another question, another, um, uh, I guess scenarios that folks have submitted is people, you know, in, in various, uh, uh, for example, somebody reported uh, recently that somebody came in, in some Trump paraphernalia in a car next to somebody, pulled up, flicked them off, uh, shouting, cursing at them. So in that situation, the best the best course of action would be to essentially just to get your take, ignore it, and just to move on and de-escalate and, and kind of uh, not react. Well, you have two choices. You either engage, and nothing ever good happens when you engage, or you remove yourself from the situation. Yep. And that is the safest route. Absolutely. Because if someone is going to have the, I guess the, the forethought to say those types of things to a person, they're not worried about any ramifications. Yeah. They don't care what's going to happen. And you don't want to engage someone like that. So I absolutely agree. It's not worth anything that can happen other than just getting away from that situation. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our next uh, question. So if you're loading your groceries or kids in the car, somebody approaches you from behind in a threatening manner, what do you do and how would you handle it differently if your kids kids are with you? So this is where that packa comes in, right? <laughs> you gotta have a plan. Now, um, my husband is also in law enforcement. He was a homicide detective. He's done and seen everything under the sun. So he and I are uh, probably a little obsessive when it comes to personal safety, especially around our children. And this is a scenario I think about a lot because it's something we can all relate to, especially as mothers, fathers. Um, this happens all the time. Grocery shopping is a very normal and um, procedural thing, routine thing we do all the time. What I would recommend is number one, when you walk out of that store, your keys better be in your hand. I like to have my phone in my hand as well, uh, because if I need to use it, I'm not digging through my purse through a hundred different things before I can find it. I have, if I am by myself, I have a direct route of where I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna dilly dally around. I'm gonna get my cart. I'm gonna push straight to my car. I am going to be looking in every possible direction. I'm going to look inside my car. I'm going to look in my back seat. I'm going to look in every um, vantage point that I can. I'm going to open my trunk. I'm going to put my <laughs> groceries in the trunk. I am going to get in the car and I'm going to go. What you can do, and um, when we talk about self-defense, one of the things that we learn is your keys. Whatever weapon you have, you utilize. Your keys can be absolute weapons. You take your longest key, you keep it right in the middle of your hand as if it's sticking out right here. If someone's coming up to you, you turn around and you jab that thing in their eye, you jab it in their neck, you jab it wherever you can, and it's gonna stun them and give you time to go. So whatever you have, again, this is part of your plan. This is the preparation. Even something so mundane as uh, grocery shopping, we see this all the time. It's a purse snatching, it is a kidnapping. If you actually knew the things that happened in your community, I think you would be um, pretty terrified to leave your house. And so that's why it's very important to have this plan in place. The ball game changes when you have children because your priority is your children. And no matter what, you've got to look out for them. So same thing, you're putting your groceries in your car. You've got to make sure you got your kids. The first thing I would do is get my kids in the car because you don't want your kids loitering around outside while you're trying to load groceries where some crazy person could come snatch them up in the parking lot and drive off before you can even turn around. And it happens because it happened. <laughs> so uh, get your kids in the car, get them secured, always look around, have your phone, have your keys. You're prepared at that point. And people don't want, uh, they want the weakest victim with the least resistance who doesn't know what's going on. So my suggestion is, Use whatever you can as a weapon. If it doesn't feel right, if it's late, ask someone from the store to escort you. If it doesn't feel right, don't go. Wait, always part of your plan. Park in an area where you know there's a light. Park under the light. Park as close as you can to the store. All these tiny little things, they all will be advantageous at the end. Yeah, and so just to add to that, I mean, minimizing distraction obviously is a big part of that preparation, right? So don't don't be texting while you're you're loading your groceries in the car. Make sure your kids are in the car. Awesome, and I were talking earlier today, and he mentioned you know buckle your kids in the car. 
So once they're in the car, just put their seatbelts on so they can't get away or somebody can just snatch them without, you know, you knowing. Um, but minimizing that distraction, being aware of your situational awareness, don't be on the phone, don't text. I mean, some you can easily take for granted that you get a phone call, it's important, you answer it, right? But in that situation, it's taken away from your situational awareness. So you don't know uh, what's going on if you're focusing on a phone call. Also, you want anything else or? No, I think that was covered well. So, okay. Nothing to add. Good. Okay, so next question. So, and we've been seeing a lot of this in the news and media and social media, but but verbal threats or verbal assaults. So you're you're kind of in a grocery store line, for example. Um, somebody mentioned that uh, a scenario where they were in this this past week, where they assumed the person didn't speak English, so they're making comments against them, and then started escalating. Uh, they were yelling at them. Um, and then uh, the person responded back and told him to back off. But but in this situation, no other shoppers intervened. So there was a, a verbal threat that had the potential to escalate, um, but nobody else in the scenario who was, who was watching intervened. So in that type of situation to de-escalate, what, what do you think the best thing would be? Just, just, just to essentially walk away and, and take yourself out of that situation? So this is, you know, when, when you are told something by a stranger that is derogatory or insulting. I mean, we're all human. Our first reaction is either to defend or to say something back equally uh, derogatory. But at the end of the day, um, there is nothing beneficial, absolutely nothing beneficial that will result from a verbal altercation. Verbal altercations almost always turn physical. And there is no need for that, especially if you have your children around. We see um, a lot of these things on Facebook and YouTube where people are uh, recording these types of incidences and you see them turn very violent. What I would suggest in that particular case is if someone is saying these types of things to you, yes, absolutely remove yourself, get in your car, and you can call 911 and say, look, this incident just occurred. There is a crime of disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct means that you have done something to put someone else in reasonable fear of receiving some kind of injury. You can call police and say, this is what happened. This individual is still inside the store. I am. Um, I removed myself from the situation, but I need an officer to respond. Now, that is one option if you want to carry it forward. It is a much better option than engaging with that person. Uh, but of course, in any situation, just walking away almost always diffuses everything and ends the situation. And, and that's always my suggestion. It's not always, doesn't always make you feel good, but it keeps you safe. So that's what we almost always say. It's just not worth it. And that's, that's the ultimate question. Is it worth it? Correct. Um, most of the time, you know, these things happen in the line, cashier line, usually, right? Because they're usually right behind you. So you can leave your stuff and walk away, right? You're, you can come back and shop again. Not a big deal. Um, like, as you know, it's a recurring theme, de-escalation is the key, right? If you feel comfortable, you can go to the customer service counter and just stand there, right? And say, hey, this guy is not being nice. I just want to stand here for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, any way you can de-escalate. Um, just, uh, you know, I, I speak Spanish fluently, but I don't look Latin to some people, and they always comment on my beards and stuff, right? Um, and sometimes it's very derogatory, and, and they mean it in joke, in jest, but I never engage, right? You, you just let it go. You just smile, and you keep moving on. It's like, whatever, you know, it's, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it, so. Okay, so you got a legal question. So is it is it legal to video record people in public in a public setting? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, have you ever watched YouTube or TikTok? Or <laughs> uh, yes, it is absolutely legal to record uh, an individual. And, and there's two types of recordings. There's audio recordings, of course, and then there's video recordings. This is how the law sort of looks at it. Video recordings in a public place are just that, it's a public place. There is no expectation of privacy that an individual has when they are in a public setting. You cannot um, 
go into someone's home, of course, without their permission and uh, videotape them because that's no longer a public setting. It becomes a private setting. Hmm. The uh, kind of it just is all things in the law. The, the gray line is when you're looking at um, a shop, for example, a store. A store is technically pro uh, private property, but it is a place where the public frequents. So you, um, uh, if you are in a store and there is a situation that is occurring or you feel might occur and you pull out your phone and you start recording, the owner of that store can tell you to stop and you would have to, or they can ask you to leave and technically you would have to. Um, if you are outside in a parking lot, um, if you are outside in a park, if you're on the road, these are all considered very public arenas. And so therefore you can record with your phone, uh, whatever you need to. So uh, it, it's, it's a legal concept and there are cases and cases and cases about this type of situation, but that's kind of the nutshell. If it's public, you can record it. If it's private, you technically um, would have to stop if uh, the authorized individual tells you to do so. Uh, Sabrina, from your experience, do you recommend recording if you have a chance, or do you consider do people usually consider that an escalation type thing? No, I mean, of course, everything is very fact specific. Yeah. Uh, but if you are uh, recordings are utilized in the criminal field as uh, evidence, correct? Uh, because usually, traditionally, one person it's he said versus he said or she said he said, etc. And when you have a recording of some kind, then obviously you don't have to have that sort of testimony. You have what you need. Sure. But I would always um, be very cautious when you are in a situation, if um, you are in a store and like some of our hypotheticals and someone is saying something to you, we see people take out their phones and start recording all the time. And uh, usually people just get madder and you record them getting madder and you record them getting madder. And uh, you really don't need to stick around for a, an hour long recording when it's getting that bad. You know, record what you need to, uh, walk away as you're doing it. And it really depends on the situation. If you're with your family, um, you know, you, the last thing you want is someone to push that phone and break it into a million pieces on the ground and then you have no way of calling for help. If you're in your car, then record it, um, you know, somewhere where you have a little distance. If, if you feel that it's something that you need to do. But remember, your main priority is to be safe, not to sit there and get as much of this recording as possible. You just want to de-escalate and remove yourself from the situation. Sure. But from a legal perspective, you can, you can record in, in, in most situations. Okay. So I guess uh, being on the law enforcement side, so if, if police, it escalates and in, in to the point where police are called, what, what would be good advice? What should people do if, if police are called to the scene? How should they react? So, you know, the, the police are, um, I'm obviously a big supporter of law enforcement. I'm married to one. This is what I do. Uh, but they come into a situation that has technically not been created by them. And they are tasked with trying to figure out in a very short period of time what happened, who is correct, and who is not. And they are not going to spend a whole heck of a lot of time trying to do that. They're going to um, look at what is there, depending on the situation. But when the police arrive, my suggestion is no court cases and no battles and no arguments have ever been won on the side of the road. They just haven't. So be respectful, be polite, as we should um, in general with anyone, um, and uh, follow the instructions. Tell them your side of the story. It's not up to them to believe you or not. It's up to them to make a record of what you have told them. And ultimately, the officers, if there is enough information, can make an arrest. Um, if not, then all of that is forwarded to the district attorney's office where we do a more intensive investigation and can make um, arrests on our own as well. But ultimately, if the police arrive, don't argue, um, just tell them what happened. Tell them your side of the story 
and that's it. And usually by virtue of being calm, you are, you have a lot more credibility than the other person who's jumping up and down and screaming and saying terrible things. So um, ultimately down the road, the police, the police have a very specific job and it is not to figure out uh, who is guilty and who is not guilty. That happens down the road. So do what you need to do, but don't aggravate the situation where you might yourself find um, that there's some handcuffs on you too for obstruction or hindering or uh, doing um, you know, something that uh, maybe uh, makes a situation more complicated. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, somebody asked about specifically if a place of business for whatever reason does not want to serve them um, or sell to them anymore are they within their rights to refuse service to a patron for whatever reason uh, so you're delving into a completely different arena at that yeah. point it is mm -hmm. not a crime to not serve someone in their um, capacity it can very well be a civil lawsuit and it almost always is for discrimination or for whatever bias that they may be. So that is a totally different uh, venue as far as a totally different path. The shop owner, and we see these all the time, there are many court cases where uh, bakeries have refused to sell uh, wedding cakes to same sex weddings, et cetera. And they have been taken all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. So if an individual business owner chooses not to uh, cater to you because of um, uh, being Muslim or being for any reason, that is um, not something you can call the police and say, look, he won't sell me whatever it is that he's selling because it's technically not a crime. But it is something that you could certainly file a lawsuit for discrimination based on various things. So we're kind of talking about two different things. So no, he shouldn't do that or she shouldn't do that and there's ramifications for that but it is not in the criminal arena just to add to that you know if, if somebody told me that they are not going to serve me um my question is do i really want to eat at their place then? yeah <laughs> so so you know it becomes a moot point it's like okay yeah you know I, i'm out of here i'm gonna give my business to somebody else and, and the power of social media is amazing because we probably see a lot of this is when you have that experience and you post your experience on social media, it's amazing how it affects that particular business and how quickly they change their stance um, in, in many situations. So remember, there's lots of options for you. It's not just, um, you know, it, this is a situation where you're not technically de-escalating. So if you, if you choose to, you can proceed in, in another way also. Okay, um, so at this time, that's basically all of the questions we receive in advance. Um, I'm gonna open, I don't see many questions on the chat. I'm gonna open it up to folks. If you're gonna ask a question, I'd ask you unmute yourself uh, and ask the question um, and then re-mute yourself after you're done. If there's any open questions right now, uh, we'll entertain those. Assalamu alaikum. This is Sahir. I had a Hello. question. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, my question is that if I am an observer to one of these situations that we just spoke about, uh, what should be my role? Is it better for me to intervene or is it better for me to uh, stand my ground and maybe, as you said, record what is going on or maybe call 911 if I feel that, you know, there is one party that's overpowering the other. My, my suggestion is to always call 911. If you are in a position where you are safely able to record, absolutely do that. Recordings are very powerful. Uh, but call 911 and let them know what you are seeing. All 911 calls are recorded and uh, let them know what is happening. Give them your information because if you are unable to stay or you don't feel safe staying around, then they will contact you to get a statement from you. Um, but it is very important that cases, criminal cases cannot be won unless victims and witnesses cooperate with us. And if you are a witness to such a situation, then I would never recommend getting involved. Now, if, if 
again, it depends on the situation. If someone is getting hurt or um, if someone is getting in a situation where you think they might be killed and you need to immediately interfere, certainly if it's your family, I think you're, you're not even going to think about it. You're going to jump in. But if it's someone you don't know, um, you have to kind of um, think about what what the um, better option is. If they have a weapon, absolutely not. Stay away, call 911, uh, because you're not going to win. You're not going to be able to help if the other person has a weapon anyway. So I would suggest always to call 911. Response times are very, very quick. And um, if you can, stay so that you can make a statement. If not, leave your information so one can be taken. Right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually had a question for Sabrina. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, the like panic buttons on phones? Mm -hmm. do, do people actually use them and how effective are they? So one of the things that I would highly suggest um, to everyone, but especially your children, is when you have an iPhone, make sure you track your iPhone or whatever phone you have, or whatever um, uh, feature you have, make sure it's on. Law enforcement, one of the biggest tools that we have that we can use to find people on their phones. Uh, we are in a society where we don't walk out the door or even from our kitchen to our bedroom without our phone in our hand. And so it's almost second nature. It is a powerful tool. Utilize the features that you have in that phone. If you are lost, if someone has taken you, if something bad is happening to you, um, law enforcement can request your location through your phone. Make sure it's charged, make sure it's on, make sure it's ready to go at all times. Um, panic buttons, all of those things work very, very well. Use them. <laughs> they, the technology is amazing. And I can't even begin to tell you how many people we find and how many crimes we solve by virtue of a cell phone which is why Apple has made it very difficult for law enforcement to get into their phones because um, criminals utilize those phones just as much as good people do. So I highly recommend that if you have a phone, utilize the features on that phone that can help you and your family. What, one of the other things she does, if you don't mind, I just wanted to um, mention, you mentioned this earlier, is uh, however you as individuals feel comfortable uh, protecting yourselves and your family. And of course, one of the biggest things that people think about are purchasing a weapon of some kind to protect yourself. And um, I, I don't know if many people actually have that or not, but the... Um, power of, of owning a weapon is immense, owning a gun in general. So if you are going to make that decision, you have to be comfortable with it because if not, it's just as dangerous to you and your family as it is to anyone else. If you're going to uh, buy a gun, then you should take a safety class. You should go and you should practice shooting that gun because if you don't know what to do with it, then it is completely useless to you. You need to know how to clean it. You need to know what happens if the gun jams. You need to be as familiar with that gun as you are with your cell phone, that you know all the ins and outs of your cell phone. But there are many other, other um, options, not just a weapon. I, um, I have a weapon, but I feel more comfortable carrying my pepper spray because it's easily accessible. Um, it is, in fact, in many studies that we have found more advantageous. When you shoot someone, they don't die right away, depending on where you shoot them. They're not immobile right away, depending on where you shoot them. Uh, they may have a weapon and they may be able to get off several rounds before they even go down. Pepper spray almost immediately immobilizes an individual. There are pepper sprays you can put on your keychain. There are mega pepper sprays that are the size of a, a milk jug that you can keep next to your bed if you're not comfortable having a weapon. And those will almost immediately uh, take an individual and drop them to their knees. In fact, police officers have to all be pepper sprayed as part of their training so they know what their body is gonna do when it happens because it is, it is so debilitating. 
So I would suggest if you're not comfortable with a weapon, to certainly look into pepper spray. You can buy it at Target, I think. Uh, and you can actually buy more intense versions online also to keep in your home. But I would highly recommend, especially if you have um, teenage daughters, teenage sons, just to, to get that. Uh, it is a, it's a great tool for everyone. Is there an advantage between mace or pepper spray or is this pepper spray more debilitating in your experience? Well, it's, um, it, it, it has the same concept. The goal is the same. They've actually recently started to make pepper gel. Um, and what that gel has started to do is when you spray pepper spray, of course, there is a cloud. And so everyone, including yourself, who's spraying it can be affected by it. So uh, there is something called pepper gel, which has a direct line. It's almost like shaving cream or, or that silly putty thing, whatever that you spray. And it has a direct stream that hits your target without a spray or a cloud. What it also does is it leaves these marks that even after you wash them, depending on the time frame in which law enforcement can get to you, that leaves an ultraviolet um, path on your face. And officers can use an ultraviolet light and you can see remnants of that spray. So you know that that's the individual who you sprayed who are trying to break in your home or, or whatever it may be. So there are so many options now to purchase. Uh, it's not the old school mace or old school pepper spray. Uh, go out there, get online, get on Amazon, look and see and, and get some. Thanks. Somebody asked about weapons at home. Um, if there's any recommendations on keeping them loaded or unloaded, obviously it's a, the, you know, everyone has a different situation, right? You have kids, access to weapons, where do you keep it, safes? Um, but in general, somebody's asking whether you, you would recommend keeping it loaded or unloaded at home. Well, so um, I have this debate with my husband often because we have young children as well. But um, if, if your weapon's not ready to go, then there's no point in having a weapon. Because if someone's breaking into your home and you're trying to figure out where your bullets are and how to get it loaded and you're shaking and you're scared and then you don't know what's happening, um, it, Time is of the essence in those situations. So when you decide to purchase a weapon, you want a weapon that has a safety on it. Uh, so you have a weapon that is ready to go where it is at least loaded with one, what's called one in the chamber, or one ready to go if you absolutely need it. Uh, but you must have that safety on it. You can have a gun box, a gun lock, which you can keep under your bed or near your bed, which literally opens in a second by a fingerprint. So that way uh, it is safe from your children, but very quickly and easily accessible if you need it, where you literally grab it from under your bed, you put your thumbprint on it, it opens, your gun's ready to go and you're ready to protect yourself or your family. And at the same time, protect your family from um, you know, accidentally using it. So. Again, there's no point in having one if you can't find it when you need it and it's not loaded and ready to go uh, when you need it. Is there any um, value to a stunning device? Over uh, <laughs> so I guess you have to be closer <laughs> contact, right? With, I, with it, it does, and um, depending on what kind you have, um, you know, uh, tasers are what most law enforcement use, and they can tase someone two or three times, and it won't make a difference. If someone is high on uh, a drug of some kind, if they are intoxicated, if they are under the influence of a drug, you can tase them three times, and they'll come at you without even flinching. So sometimes the, prong, the, the thing with those types of things are, um, you know, the prongs have to hit you in the right place. The stun has to hit you in the right place. It's not reliable. And then does the, does, uh, this is a question, do, do police departments have any resources on personal training or is it safe, personal safety training? Absolutely. Most of the larger departments do uh, have uh, what's called community-oriented policing, top for short, cops for short, and they will put together a, 
uh, presentation for all of you or for anybody who's interested. You uh, speak with the particular officer and um, I can certainly, if that's something you guys are looking to do, I can certainly help you connect with the particular um, agencies. I work for Gwinnett. I know Gwinnett Police does that um, and most of the agencies do, so yes. They will sit down. They'll have the very similar conversation as we're having now, but of course they have a lot more uh, experience from being on the road and dealing with individuals. I deal with individuals once they're all cleaned up and in a suit in a courtroom. <laughs> you know, the officers deal with them when they're still high on meth and um, you know waving a, a, a pole around trying to hit everyone. So it's a very different vantage point, and sure. they will do that. Somebody is asking whether you personally, or as a law enforcement officer with the election this week, are you modifying your regular routine or, or doing anything different or anything to avoid this week? Would you recommend? Uh, yes, I am actually. Uh, I, I work in a political office. My, my DA is up for election right now, so no one's going to work. We're, um, it, it is a... Um, um, my husband is actually not able to be part of this because he is currently on call for this election. Uh, most of the police departments have utilized their resources to um, be ready because as we've seen throughout the country, if an election, even though we won't have those results on Wednesday, um, there's all these polls and there's misinformation and a lot of places anticipate either rioting or protesting or looting. Um, and so I would suggest that everyone, you know, stay home, get a nice cup of chai and <laughs> call it a night for at least two nights <laughs> and, uh, you know, skip your target run for another day. Any other questions from anybody uh, in the audience? No questions. The, the one thing I have to say is that uh, every time we talk to a victim, they always tell us right before something really bad happens that I knew something wasn't right. I just had this feeling. And so my suggestion to all of you is if you have that feeling, it just doesn't feel right, then go with it. You know, go back in the store. Um, don't um, engage. Just walk away, drive away, um, you know, inshallah at that point, um, that is the best way to protect yourselves. Don't be scared to call 911. They will respond. They will help um, do whatever you need to to protect your family. We, I am always available. Um, I'll be happy to pass on my contact information to all of you um, through Chizan. And if you have any questions, even after this, you want to email me or call me or talk to me privately, then please don't hesitate to do that. Inshallah, I'll be more than happy to help. Sister Sabrina, could you, if you have some extra time, could you just shed some light on cyber crime and cyber bullying and things like that? Um, you know, because uh, this topic came up, like at my workplace, they, they were having a session today about how to help kids manage with that increased digital exposure during COVID. So cyberbullying and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of best practices for kids came up. So I want to know, is, do you have any advice from the law enforcement uh, perspective? Yes, we, uh, we do see this a lot. We see it a lot more uh, right now. We, most uh, of the jurisdictions have what's called a school police force that work within the schools and they handle a lot of these situations. But the, the way you've got to monitor and you have to monitor what your children are watching, what they're doing, who they're chatting with, what they are doing online. When your child, because a lot of times, just like if you're being bullied in person at school, children are reluctant or hesitant to talk about it with their parents or with anyone. It becomes internalized and then it, and it just, it's a downward spiral. Uh, same thing with cyberbullying. You're not going to be comfortable, and that's just a, a normal human thing, especially at that age. We find that it is when we finally find out that this has been happening, it's been happening for months, if not longer. So be observant of your children. You know your children better than anyone. Is there a change in attitude? 
is there a change in their mindset? Do they not want to go places? Do they just want to sit in their room? Do they not want to have a conversation with you? You've got to be aware of the sort of clues that your children are giving you. And then you got to hound them. You got to ask them, what is going on? You know, is something happening? Is someone saying something to you? And then depending on who it is, if it's coming from the school, then you deal with it through the school administrators. But if they are on some sort of chat room and there's someone outer space somewhere having this conversation, then you got to cut off um, that type of communication. But um, the, the one thing I would suggest is that you've got to continue to communicate with your kids. You've got to let them know that this exists, that it's okay if it happens, that it's okay for them to talk to you. Um, and, and it's just repeating that over and over again. But it happens. It happens all the time. And it is so hard to catch people who do this because they are in the safety of, of the World Wide Web. So the only thing you can do is to immediately interact with your children and keep an eye out for any kind of issues that are occurring that you notice. Okay, any other questions? We've got about nine minutes left. Uh, can I ask, uh, I know most of what, and, and thank you very much, this, this has been very excellent uh, and very enlightening. Uh, most of what you, uh, most of what you focused on was on personal safety in, in different scenarios. And um, I know I missed a few minutes from the beginning, so I don't know if that was, uh, that, that was the only focus, but would you uh, uh, kindly share perhaps some uh, key best practices for mosques uh, and, and safety and, and, and watching out for uh, danger or any potential threats for masajid mosques in particular. Uh, Shazan, is that something you want to? Yeah. I'll be happy to chime in too. Yeah, sure. So, so, so generally, you know, especially for, and I'll focus on, on, on this week specifically. So for this week, kind of with the heightened environment, um, I've been recommending masjids essentially focus on situational awareness for the masjid itself. So, so to have, have uh, you know, be aware of your facility. Um, if there's non-essential programs occurring um, throughout this week to take a look and, and see, obviously you have, you have two facets to that, right? You have protecting the institution itself, but more importantly, protecting bricks and mortar is protecting people, right? So if you have folks this week um, at the masjids having programs during the day, during the evening, um, then, then take the effort to provide protection, whether it's arm protection or other, otherwise. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the mushes have been, you know, calling their um, local police officers out during the, the daylight day programs, and also during Salat al Juma. Um, so, so take a look at that and see what you're doing this week um, and, and plan accordingly. Um, a lot of mushes also have camera systems, so you know, camera systems are good, but but more importantly, motion alerts. So, so if there's somebody trespassing on your premises um, that shouldn't be there. Um, how do you know that they're there, right? If, if no one's watching that camera system, no one's, you know, understanding they're on the premises, um, it's important to be able to uh, to do that. And then and finally, access control, right? So people this week, especially, um, there's been instances in the community, you know, we've had situations at RCM last week where there was a vehicle next door that was somewhat suspicious, it was a cargo van. So, um, you know, keep keep an eye out on those things, make sure folks in the community know what to look for encourage folks that are on the premises to report anything out of suspicious um, to the security team at the masjid. Awesome. Anything you want to add to that? Um, excuse me. I have a question. Uh, well, I think that was Asada. We'll get to your question yeah. in just one second. I just wanted to add one more thing. Just to walk around your facility would be a good idea as well. Um, you know, we are notorious to leave windows open, doors open, doors cracked open. Um, you know, just uh, if anything happens, you know, it'd be out to tomorrow night. Um, so tomorrow during the day, I walk around the masjid, making sure all the cameras are pointed where they need to be pointed. All the windows are closed and locked. Um, all the doors, you know, that are propped open um, are closed. Um, you know, simple things like that um, can, can help a lot as well. Okay, my question was... Uh, can, can I add something? Sorry. Um, Asim, uh, 
Yeah. This is Mahir. Uh, one thing that's really important to also do, uh, even like for the next 24 hours, contact your police department and make sure you have a direct line with them. They're familiar with where you are. They're familiar with, you know, your concerns uh, and, and, you know, the times of your service and, and so forth. Uh, having a good relationship, active relationship with your police department is key as a, as a masjid. And this time and any time, actually, but, but this is especially highlighted, this, you know, this kind of, this kind of situation. Um, can I can I ask my question? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> after COVID nineteen and you're on Friday to make your salat, and what if an offender walks into the masala and you're done praying, but there's like a million people in there? What what should what should be the first thing that you should do to get out? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Shazan, you want to take it? No, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood, yeah. I understood the question. Okay, so after COVID-19, we usually go to the masjid to make salat. And what if you're in the masala and there's like a lot of people there and an offender walks into the masala? What should be the first thing that you would do? Well, what should be the first action that you take to get out? You're asking if there's an armed offender coming into the masala? Yes. I mean, this goes back to preparation, right? So the, the masjid should should have folks outside watching for armed threats coming in, right? So so back to preparation. I mean, you you have to have you have to have eyes on the facility itself to see any threats that approach. If somebody is in the facility with a weapon and you're there, <clears throat> the only option essentially you have at that point is to do three things: is to run, hide, and fight. If you're in an open environment and they're in, right in front of you, then the only option you really have is to either run or fight. You can't really hide anywhere. So, so at that point, if you're faced with an aggressor, um, running or fighting are your only options. Um, again, the but, best option out of the two is running, yeah. right? If you can run, run for sure. Right. If you have I, no I, other option, then you, know, you have no other option, then you have to fight. <laughs> Thank you for answering my question. I do have a question. This is Ahmed. Go ahead. Most of us are active on social media. Whenever there is a threat, harassment, bullying, we can always block that individual. However, sometimes it's pretty serious. Is there a unit or should we be calling 911? Uh, does each department have like a specific unit for, you call it cyber bullying or social media bullying? Uh, when someone makes a threat, it doesn't matter how they make it. They can text you the threat. They can call you and make you a threat. They can verbally make the threat to you. It's still a crime when a threat is made against you. So you call, you definitely contact the police. What you want to do is definitely make sure you take a screenshot, something to preserve the threat. Uh, take a picture with your phone, contact law enforcement, uh, and they will handle it like they would if someone came to your house and made the threat to your face. Because regardless, the threat is a threat. So it is an absolute crime. Um, it, it's actually the, the term for it is actually terroristic threat um, when you actually threaten to do some sort of bodily harm to an individual, whether it be to uh, punch them in the face or, or, or murder them or burn the house down. So you absolutely uh, contact law enforcement because it's still a threat to your life or your safety and they will treat it accordingly. And uh, there are many ways to try and find out where that threat came from if you don't know who that person is. They'll get on there, they'll track down the IP address. They'll, there's a whole, um, what's called a white collar unit at the police department, most of them, where they are trained specifically in uh, internet type crimes and they can locate individuals most of the time as long as they are local uh, or in the country uh, who have made these types of threats. That's how they find a lot of people. So we're, we're right about out of time. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and share a couple of final thoughts and try to summarize a little bit. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So, so just to quickly summarize what we talked about. So again, situational awareness um, in, in these scenarios is extremely important. 
be aware of your surroundings, minimize your distractions, don't be on the phone, don't text. When you're there with your family, if you're alone with your kids, be there, be present. Um, as much as possible, plan or be prepared for your environment. You're not gonna be able to plan for every possible scenario, but try to consciously understand where you're gonna be and where you place yourself. So whether that's staying in well-lighted areas, parking near the front of the grocery store, uh, populated areas, avoid isolated parking lots, doorways or alleys, make a conscious choice for where you're gonna be and plan accordingly. Um, when you're walking, walk confidently with purpose at a steady pace, uh, make eye contact with folks. As Sabrina said, don't look like a target. Um, and then practice, 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 practice scenarios with your family, um, meeting up in case of separation. I have a friend who practices uh, getting in the car quickly in a dangerous scenario. He calls it urgency, emergency. So there's a code word he uses in, his, in, the, in that code word, all the kids, no questions asked, get in the car, right? If I ask my kids to get in the car quickly, they're going to probably take 10 times as long. <laughs> so, so, so doing it quickly, practice scenarios with your family, try to think of situations and, and, and be safe. And obviously using technology, we talked about um, your, your location sharing with your Android and your um, iPhone. There's also third-party apps. Um, some of them, Be Safe, Noonlight, Kite String, um, those that allow you to share your live location with the press of one button. Um, there's check-in text messaging apps where, you know, someone, you can send a text message and somebody uh, has to check in with you. And if they don't, they send an emergency alert at your location. Um, dash cams in your vehicle can, can, be, can be an important tool. So if you have a recording of an, a, a scenario uh, that can be used later, that, that would be helpful. So um, in general, preparation and planning is, is, is one of the most important things that we can do. Make a conscious choice um, and try to be prepared as much as possible. Any closing thoughts, Sabrina or Awesome? Shazan, can I jump in here? This is Basim. Go ahead, Basim. Uh, I wanted to ask one question. I tried to ask it uh, on the chat a couple of times. What if the perpetrator or the offender is somebody at the office and you don't want, you can't walk away and you, you don't want to call 911? Is there, uh, you know, what, what do you say then? Do you go to the management or, or what are some of the, uh, practical things that if somebody hears uh, something they don't like or offensive over the next few days, uh, what can they do at the office? Thank you. And thank you for doing this, everyone. Jazakumullah uh, khair. You're welcome. Uh, I would suggest that an HR department or an immediate manager, immediate supervisor, you want to make sure that you also document everything uh, that when the incident occurred, when you spoke with the supervisor, what the supervisor said. The supervisor should be documenting this as well, but you want to take it upon yourself. Uh, not everything has to involve law enforcement or the criminal justice system. A lot of things can be worked out internally. And in a workplace, you have a lot of different uh, issues you have to think about. You've got to work with these people every day and you, you have to work. So uh, I would suggest going to your immediate supervisor. If your company has an HR department, that is their job. And they are required by law to log these types of complaints. So that's, that's what I would suggest. Uh, just to add to that, even <laughs> again, you know, I'll get to de-escalation, right? That that you don't even want to try to get into that situation. So, you know, I'm a physician, and I work in North Georgia. Um, I'll just leave it at that. So, uh, a lot of people, you know, have interesting comments, and and I just stop them even before they start. I'm like, listen, I'm here to take care of your medical needs. Why don't we just focus on that, right? So, even before they start going into that, it's like. Why don't we just stick to, you know, what you're here for? And they get the point and they're like, okay, and they back off. Okay, I think with that, uh, we're over time. So we'll end. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel, feel free to email the masjid. We will uh, respond accordingly. Uh, thank you so much for everybody for being out here tonight. And inshallah, stay safe this week. Thanks so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.